There are people who say that the idea of an independent self is the root of all evil. That as long as you have an idea that you are somehow separate and that you're not totally dependent on everybody else, you're going to be selfish. Try to amass as much as you can for yourself and push other people away unless they can serve your interests. But that's not always the case. When you realize that true well-being lies in acting in skillful ways, acting in skillful intentions, even if you have the idea of an independent self, you would want to act on impulses for generosity, virtue, the desire to train the mind. And you avoid a lot of the, the problems of the idea of an interdependent self. If everybody were interdependent, nobody could gain awakening through his or her own efforts. That would mean that the Buddha had to gain awakening. We'd all have to gain awakening together. And you know how long that's going to take. As the Buddha himself said, or as he refused to say when he was asked, was the whole world going to gain awakening, or only half or a third? He refused to answer. Because it's going to depend on each one of us deciding that we want to follow the path and follow it all the way through. And the idea of an independent self also reminds you that if you're going to look for goodness in the world, you can't always depend on it coming from the outside. You want your goodness to be independent of the ups and downs of the world, because you look at the world we live in, and it's not 100% pure, not 100% compassionate. And we look at interdependent systems in the world. It's not the case that they're designed for the well-being of everybody. We're having a heat wave now. Someplace, somebody's having good weather. And if we weren't having our heat wave, they wouldn't be having their good weather. And there have been times in the past when we've had good weather that's caused other people to have bad weather. So it's not the case that interdependent systems are reliable. In fact, it's because they're unreliable that the Buddha says we've got to get out. And each of us has to make that decision for him or herself and follow the path, him or herself. So we have to learn how to make our goodness independent. It's a good practice when you're suffering. Say, for example, you're suffering from a disease. And there are a lot of things you can't do. You can still think thoughts of goodwill. Think of the case of the Buddha. Devadatta had rolled a stone down the mountain trying to kill the Buddha. Fortunately, the stone crashed against a rocky promontory, but it broke into some slivers, and one of the slivers pierced the Buddha's foot. It was very painful. They were able to get the sliver out, and so he had to lie down and rest. Mara came and taunted him, saying, You sleepyhead, why are you moping here? The Buddha said, I'm not moping, I'm lying down with sympathy for all beings. Now, that can mean two things. One is he looked after himself so he would be able to continue his work of teaching. But also while he was lying there, he was thinking about all beings, not just thinking about himself. When you do that, it lifts the level of your mind. Remember the image of the salt crystal? If your mind is expansive, and whatever painful results you're experiencing from past karma are going to be a lot less. Just like throwing a salt crystal into a large river of water. Even though you put some salt in the water, there's so much more water than there is salt that you can still drink it. And it won't taste salty at all. So look inside yourself for the sources of goodness. They're there. And they start with the desire to find true happiness. 
And around that desire, you're going to develop a sense of self. And you'll find that your sense of self will start out with a lot of the bad habits of your old senses of self. Every becoming has a sense of self. The self is the, the agent that's going to do the work that needs to be done to find the happiness that that particular state of becoming is centered on, or the desire for which it's centered on. Then there's the self that's going to enjoy the results. And then there's the self that comments on how well the agent is doing it, the job, and offering recommendations for how it might improve. We're still going to use those three senses of self as we practice, but we have to train them. So the self as the consumer raises its standards. The self as the agent gets more energetic. And the self as commentator knows how to talk. So as to spur the the agent on to do good things, but also offer criticisms when it's necessary, but not do it in such a way as to kill your motivation, because you've got to keep that desire going. As long as you're working on concentration, there has to be the, the desire to act as a center, as a kernel for the state of concentration. And you don't want to snuff that out. So you've got to train your critic inside. You be a useful critic. You read so much about trying to get rid of the inner critic because it's toxic. But then who's going to make recommendations? Who's going to be able to look at what you're doing and give suggestions? Teachers can't step into your mind and give suggestions. You've got to absorb their values and learn how to use them. So you think about the Buddha's way of teaching. There's instructing, but then there's also urging, rousing, encouraging, giving you energy. In fact, even when he talks about self, the self is its own mainstay, the self is its governing principle. That's what you call the idea of self as a performative truth, something that's meant to make you perform well, that rouses you, that urges you on, that yes, you can do this and yes, you will benefit from it. And yes, you do have the resources inside, because what have you got? There's three kinds of fabrication. You're breathing, you're talking to yourself, you're dealing with perceptions and feelings. We can learn how to do all that in, in skillful ways. You keep on breathing, but now you breathe in different ways. You breathe with the whole body. You think of the breath energy coming in and out from different parts of the body. You explore the nature of the breath energy in the body. Because when the Buddha talks about the in and out breath, he doesn't classify it as a contact at the body. He classifies it as part of one of the properties in the body itself. So the breath is already there. The air just comes in and goes out. That's what makes contact. But the breath energy in the body is something you want to explore, and there's, it has lots of potentials. The same with the way you talk to yourself. You can talk to yourself in ways that destroy your desire to practice. But why would you want to do that? Your inner critic may be good at that kind of putting down, but you have to ask the critic, what does the critic get out of this? Who's benefiting? There may be some parts of the mind that would rather not practice. And they put on the voice and the appearance of your inner critic. But you've got to take that rule back, make it serve the Dharma. So here you're talking to yourself about the breath. Talk to yourself about how well the mind is settling down with the breath, what can be done to fix the breath if they're not settling down together. 
what it can be learned to the mind. That's useful conversation, that's useful criticism. And finally, the feelings and perceptions. We have our old perceptions that we keep plastering onto things. But those can be changed. The Buddha gives you so many useful perceptions to apply. Think of all the different skilled craftsmen, craftspeople that the Buddha has you think about yourself as being like. Like a good cook, like a good archer, a good soldier, even a good elephant. A good horse, a well-trained horse. You think about the trained animals, they don't start out trained. It takes a while for them to get used to being trained, but then they have those abilities. They can do it. If animals can do it, why can't you think about that nun, Danta, who spent the whole day meditating and was not getting anywhere. She comes out of the forest, and there's an elephant with a trainer. And the trainer says, okay, give me your foot. And the elephant lifts his foot in such a way that the elephant trainer can use the foot to get onto the elephant's neck. And the nun thinks, even animals can be trained, why can't I? So think in those ways that urge and rouse and encourage you, because you have the potentials inside. There are potentials in the body in terms of the potentials of the breath element, the water element, earth, fire. There are potentials in the mind. And this is why the perception of self, when it's useful, can actually perform a function. We hear so much that the five aggregates lie beyond your control. They're not totally beyond your control. If they're totally beyond your control, nobody would have the illusion that they were you or yours. And as the Buddha points out, right concentration is made out of the five aggregates. You can control them to that extent. It is possible. They have that potential. And it's not just the Buddha's aggregates, or John Munn's aggregates, or John Lee's aggregates. Your aggregates can be shaped as well. They have that potential too. So there are times when thinking about an independent self is a really useful idea. Especially at times like this, when the world is going crazy. You have to remind yourself, okay, there is a source of goodness inside, and it's totally independent of things outside. We owe it to the Buddha because he showed us this way, and that's to that extent that we're totally dependent on admirable friendship. But we can take those lessons and use them to find the resources within ourselves. So that Goodness can be independent of the situation around us. We think about the heat wave. Well, don't make the heat wave an obstacle. We think about the situation in the world at large. Well, don't make that an obstacle. You have pains in your body. Don't make them an obstacle. There's a way around all those obstacles, and it can be found from within. So those are ways in which a sense of independent self is useful. So make the most of them.